Hello everyone. So let us continue with the genetic algorithm in today's lecture. So in the last class we were talking about parent selection using Rowlett wheel. This is a kind of randomized method of selection of parent. Also here we were taking a consideration while discussing this uh, uh, you know set of numeric values. Uh, we actually looked at the fitness as one major criteria for the selection, but two fit or the most fit parents if selected may uh, you know block cert certain further searches, so they may not be able to give us a clue to explore even farther away, right? Even though they are giving us uh, some uh, you know fitness value considering the fact that this fitness value gives us a solution close to the optimal solution, uh, still this may block. So that is why Rowlett wheel method uh, focuses on selecting fit parents from the pool of fit parents and uh, picks them up randomly. You can always set a threshold here for taking um, you know parents included in the pool of parents where uh, suppose I select the threshold as 4. So anything larger than or equal to 4 would be taken as uh, you know the feasible candidate for the parent selection. So in that case we would have actually uh, discarded chromosome 1 and 2. So this is also one possible way of uh, picking up the parents. There could be several parents whose fitness value is even lesser than 2. So those could be rejected and they cannot be uh, or they should not be taken into the overall parent selection process. Fine. So here is uh, the algorithm for uh, selecting the parents. What we do here is that we initialize the sum as 0 and then for all members of population that means we must have created some random uh, chromosomes of certain length the length remains fixed among the population and for all the members we are trying to find out the total sum of the fitness of the individual right so this for loop runs for the total sum of the fitness as we did in the previous uh, example and then we find the sum of probabilities then for all members of the population what do we do we pick up the probability as fitness divided by sum. So this is nothing but a simple formula to compute the probability of uh, one uh, particular event. So fitness gives us the favorable number of ways and sum gives us the total number of ways in order to compute this probability. So the sum of probabilities will be uh, you know picked up and the probability will be computed. So sum of probabilities will become sum of probabilities plus the previous probability right. So basically this is something which uh, gives us a way to compute the probability and then we loop until new population is full right. What do we do? We do this twice so that we can select two parents. We create a random number between 0 and 1 and for all members of population what do we do? If this random number is greater than the probability but less than next probability then this member gets selected. Right. So it all depends on which random number you have selected for the um, parent from pool of fit parents. So this is a very straightforward um, algorithm to select a parent based on the random number generator value. Okay. So then uh, this part is clear. Is there any doubt here? Fine. So then how many fit chromosomes should be selected? This is one question which we should um, target using the uh, parameters of genetic algorithm. So if the number of chromosomes with fitness value greater than a specified threshold is uh, specified threshold in generation T is P, right? This is the um, number of chromosomes with fitness value greater than a speci specified threshold. 
And uh, if the crossover probability is PC, that means only, um, you know, PC percent or PC uh, multiplied by 100 chromosomes or PC multiplied by P chromosomes are selected as parents. So this probability PC also is one of the important parameters of genetic algorithm. So these participate pairwise in crossover to produce offsprings of the new generation. Is that okay? So how many such parents are we going to use for the uh, crossover operation is equal to PC multiplied by P. So you can understand that this P um, with a subscript of C is actually going to give us the uh, probability, right? So what probability should it be? That we will get only through the experiment. Uh, as I told you in the last class that uh, we do not have uh, hyperparameter optimization methods to compute such values, which which PC value would be the best for the task that we want to solve using genetic algorithm. So this will be only experiment with the validation data set and then will be used for the uh, testing and other things. Okay, so then uh, <clears throat> you have mutation where exploitation is uh, the target that we reach by simply changing these bits. So if the Mutation probability is PM, then PM multiplied by P chromosomes undergo the mutation process. So you understand that there were P initial chromosomes. Okay, so I'll just uh, clean this and uh, change the color. <coughs> so if, uh, P is the total number of uh, fit parents, okay. Uh, above the threshold of fitness value. So you can say that their fitness value is greater than or equal to the threshold value, okay? So if P is that number, then if we have one parameter as PC, then we take this as the crossover probability, okay? And uh, we have PM, which, take, which we take as mutation probability. So mutation probability will apply on the number of bits. Suppose, um, you know, the total number of bits in a chromosome. Let us say total number of bits <coughs> in a chromosome is say capital N, then how many bits will be mutated? Can you tell? You can always decide on the number of uh, bits to be mutated. Of course, the value PM, right, PM multiplied by P is going to be the total number of chromosomes that undergo the mutation process. It is not that every chromosome will be uh, changed for the bit uh, positions so as to exploit the neighborhood, okay? So this is a different number, but you want to decide upon how many bits will be um, flipped in a chromosome of size N, you will have to still create a random number. So create a random number, let us say this number comes out to be 10, that means 10 different bits will be picked up randomly and their bits will be uh, changed. So uh, for the crossover, we have different strategies. One is one point crossover. That means you can have only one place from where you can split the original parent bits and can create the crossover office strings. So, so the office strings are created by combining the first part of first uh, beta string and the second part of the second beta string as we discussed in the last class. So then you can also have two point crossover. So if uh, out of uh, let us say capital N number of bits, you have two crossover points, one at a bit between 10 and 11 and another between 
bit 20 and 21. So then uh, you will be actually picking up the three pieces alternatively from each string and will create the uh, new of springs. So crossover mask is also created randomly. You can always create a mask which gives you some one values for those bits where you can apply the crossover. This also can be created randomly or this can be created using some heuristic. So uniform crossover, this combines bits samples from the two parents, okay. So yesterday we were talking about uh, feature selection. So I'll just pause it, okay. So uh, when we talk about feature selection, uh, we have given set of features and we select only few most informative and discriminative features. So the problem is that you have a set of features, right? So we can still label them uh, as F1, F2, F3 and so on. So there will be various uh, other features and let us say F of N, these are N different features, okay? You can correlate if in the face recognition problem you have to identify the, uh, the set of features. Then there could be, you know, if you are going with the geometric shapes, then it could be the size of the, you know, nose or the distance between two eyes. F3 could be the, you know, curvature of the forehead or width of the forehead or, you know, curvature of the chin and so on. Of course, these type of features are very, very costly in terms of their computational cost. So we do not go for these type of uh, geometric features. Of course, they also have one limitation that they are not robust to expressions. If suppose somebody is smiling, the length of the lip will change and different other kinds of curvatures will differ. So we do not take such features which are not robust. And Suppose we go for a wavelet transform which is um, peculiarly working behind to capture the structure of the cheekbone or structure of eye and the kind of uh, undulations in the face. So some features uh, are, you know, very, very stable. They do not change with respect to the pose or the direction of light or the expressions. So out of, out of so many wavelet features or let us say we go for discrete cosine transform, several features will be redundant. We may have to select some features which are most discriminative and most informative. Out of n such coefficients of wavelet transform or Fourier transform or discrete cosine transform, etc., now we need to select the features. So if I'm saying that I'm selecting a set of features, let us say very, very particularly a feature uh, F2 I'm selecting but not F1 and also I'm now selecting F5 but not 3 and 4 and then I'm selecting F9, okay, then F10. Right, let us say we have just uh, 10 features and uh, we have selected only 4. So for this particular explanation, let me take n as 10, okay, the n is taken as 10. So out of 10 features, I am selecting only 4 features. So selected number of selected features. Is equal to 4, okay. So how do we express this as a chromosome, right? How do we express this as a chromosome? We express this as a string of bits. How can we express this as a bit string? Suppose our bit string is 10 bits long, right? So that means I could have represented this entire selection as 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, right, 0, uh, 1, and 1, okay. So, yes, Pawan has given it uh, right, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. So, are there three zeros? 
after five, six, seven, eight, yeah, three zeros, and uh, then two ones. Is there anything that I have missed out, or you have put uh, one extra zero? Yeah, fine. So that's okay. So you have understood the formation of the uh, selection of the features. So if I say that this is my bit string for the feature selection, um, of course, where does where do we get this information that this string is giving me the optimal solution or not? Let me call this string say S, right? Uh, S or uh, let me call it P1, representing some uh, chromosome. Then there could be another selection. I am taking randomly something, say 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, okay? Uh, and uh, 0, 0, 0, 1. Oh, should it be should it be fine so i have taken 10 and of these i have taken five features uh, the five features that i have selected in p2 are um, yeah uh, one f1 is the selected feature then two and three are not selected and then one is specifying the selection and zero is signifying the um, exclusion right so we are not we are excluding feature 2 and 3 in P2, okay, and uh, then fourth feature is selected, then fifth feature is not selected, sixth and seventh are selected, and then tenth, are, tenth is selected. So if we can create this, these two random strings, fine, how will we judge their worth? The worth will be judged by some fitness function. So fitness function uh, can you guess what could be the fitness function? What defines the worth of the selected features in any recognition task in machine learning? Can you tell? Yes, anyone? The discrimination factor, good. So how will you judge this discrimination? How will you evaluate this discrimination factor, Weber? So suppose you select these five features, that means you have a complete training data, right? Training data was there when you saw earlier classification discussions. It was in terms of capital X and the Y. Y is the label of the class. So suppose you had, uh, you know, some 20 such samples, 20 samples. I'm not taking M and N it will actually confuse you to so 20 samples for training let us say we took okay where x is now a feature vector which is governed by this particular chromosome so now x is defined by the first feature the fourth feature the fifth feature okay fourth feature and then sixth and seventh sixth feature and a seventh feature and a tenth feature. That means first, fourth, sixth, seventh, and tenth. We will have to select only this for all x, for all samples, right? So then in that case, the second feature and the third feature will not be considered for uh, any sample. And if we pick up these uh, features, what are we expecting from these uh, five valued feature vectors uh, about their behavior in the five dimensional space of input? You have already seen that we can um, visualize these training data points as the as the points in the training data as the points in the n dimensional space. You you have already seen some examples where we actually picked up y as a color information in order to tell that this is a particular class. Maybe y equals 1 is green color and y equals 2 is blue color. So the labels are associated with each such point. And a point now in this example is a five-dimensional point, right? So the discriminating factor of this kind of selection of features would highlight that the 
two different classes, you know, feature vectors would plot in a five dimensional space quite far away. If they, if they, you know, plot quite far away from each other, we would understand that a particular combination of these features F1, F4, F6, F7 and F10 is highly discriminative. Discriminative should not have a meaning to say that one blue point or one red point falls somewhere else like this. We do not have to discriminate among similar class samples in a classification problem. We have to discriminate between the samples belonging to other classes. So I am removing this uh, uh, oddly placed red dot. And now if you look at this, you will see that they are, you know, separated from each other heavily. This much is the kind of distance between the two. Are you understanding the, um, you know, concept of discrimination? Okay. So, that is what is the meaning of this uh, selection with respect to the discrimination factor. So, if you have to optimize such discrimination, what would be, yeah. So, blue and red, I have just taken uh, sample points. Basically, you try to understand here that P1 and P2, they are not the data points. They are suggesting the inclusion of some features, right? Picking up P2 would mean that I have taken first feature, fourth feature, sixth feature, seventh feature and tenth feature in my overall plotting of the points. Because I am taking 20 samples for training, including all red and blue points, there would be 20 different samples. So, red and blue points do not represent P1 and P2. Red and blue points in this example are representing the samples, which are samples of the training data, X, which are plotted in five-dimensional space using the selected features. So, basically, this is showing you the discriminating power of P2. The kind of figure that I am showing you here is, displaying the uh, discriminating power of P2. Yes, samples, samples of selected features may not be the right phrase. I am saying sample is a data, right? And selected features are the attributes which I am using to define those objects. Say for example, somebody may define a a fruit by its color, right? Somebody may define a fruit by its color and texture, but the other person may be, you know, discriminating between two types of fruits by their internal structure of seeds and the arrangements of seeds. Which particular, you know, uh, feature selection or which particular uh, set of features would give us the best discrimination would uh, be considered for the uh, for the classification. So there are no four four features. I, in my example, I am taking five features out of ten. If I am taking uh, P two, okay. So twenty samples. Uh, yes, twenty samples with five features each, not four. So with P two, I am defining this X with P two. Right? Had I defined uh, my same objects using P1, P1 is the sequence of bits where each one is representing the inclusion of the feature. Had I used P1, then I would have selected second, fifth, ninth, and tenth features. But now uh, this one X I am defining by F1, F4, F6, F7, F10, I'm actually using P2 to define these features. Okay? And similarly, we will do the same feature extraction for all 20 samples. And with those five values which I extract, 
I will plot them in a five dimensional space. Right? Have you understood the difference and the role of P2 and P1? Yeah, Kishori? Yeah. What is your uh, response? Understood? So here P2 and P1, they are representing the beta strings to represent inclusion or exclu exclusion of some features. Right? So P1 has four features. P2 has five features. Had we selected P1 and then we would have described those 20 samples with four features, we should have plotted them in four dimensional space because they were only four features, right? So the two types of formations will be different. Naveen, is this okay? So we cannot plot using P1 in five dimensional space because now Anyhow, we are only relying on these four features, F2, F4, F5, F9, and F10. But wherever we plot, whether we use P1 and plot in a four-dimensional space, or we use P2 and plot in five-dimensional space, we have to compute some kind of discriminative uh, distance. In that case, Fitness function will be the distance between those two samples, those two sets of samples belonging to two different classes. So it is again an optimization problem. So if you represent fitness to be the distance, suppose I write uh, fitness to be something like a calculatable distance, okay, between red and blue, okay, or clusters you can say. That means you always want such combination of features which gives us maximum fitness. That means the maximum distance. There could be one possibility that you had another P3, another bit string, which is much stronger than this. I may say that I'm, ha I'm having something like 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, right? These are only 8 bits, so I am taking 1 and 0. In that case, I would have said that I am taking 9th feature, 7th feature, 6th feature, and 5th feature, and it may so happen that the fitness value of P3 comes out to be, let us say, very high, maybe 100. The distance is 100 units between the red cluster and the blue cluster. But it may so happen that the fitness using P1, right? Fitness using P1 comes out to be, uh, let us say, 76. And the fitness using P2 becomes equal to, let us say, 50 or 40. So what will you say, which is the most fit bit string? Most fit bit string is the one which separates the two clusters maximum. So in these three examples where I'm having fitness value of P1 as 76, it is only fictitiously taken. Of course, you will have another set of algorithms to compute this distance even, right? So fitness of P1 is 76, fitness of P2 is 40, and fitness of P3 is 100. Which one is considered to be the uh, the most fit chromosome? That will be P3. So this means P3 separates the samples, the 20 samples, by the maximum distance of 100. And this is maximum as compared to what you get uh, using P1 and P2. So when it should have, it could have actually been something that you combine these two strings B1 and uh, sorry P1 and P2, and somehow you get this P3. Maybe in one generation or two generations, two iterations, right? This is how we will say that from 76 and 40 fitness, we are moving to a better fitness 
of 100 genetic algorithm evolves more stronger chromosomes right only problem with genetic algorithm or particle swarm optimization or even other evolutionary algorithms is that they rely heavily on their hyperparameters, the algorithm parameters. As I told you, what should be the value of PM, what should be the value of PC, and how many crossover points should we take, which should be our crossover points, whether it should be fifth, between fifth and sixth point, or seventh and twentieth uh, and twenty-first point, like that, which should be our um, you know, split points and how many there should be. So, based on such careful selection of those parameters, genetic algorithm has been established to converge to the most fit chromosome. Okay. So, uh, have you understood the worth of the chromosome using this distance metric for used for separating the uh, clusters of uh, or the you know formation of the clusters belonging to two different class. Is this okay? Have you understood the feature selection problem uh, being solved using the other uh, genetic algorithm? Anyone? Is there any doubt? Okay, so now can you suggest one more measure for calculating the worth of a chromosome, which uh, instead of distance between red and blue, uh, which particular uh, criteria can be used to compute the fitness value of a, a chromosome? Yes, angle you are saying, the angle between what Anish? Angle of what? So the form there is no formula for calculating the fitness. You have to understand that um, fitness is calculated for uh, producing certain results. I could even take the fitness function as the overall accuracy of classification. I may have the validation set and then I would go for uh, classifying those points in the validation set or those type of you know X and Y pairs in the validation set which will produce some uh, accuracy. So based on the selected features using P1 or P2, uh, we will have the corresponding accuracy of the uh, samples in the validation set. Yeah, so the entropy or gain could be one factor uh, that would be, you know, used for calculating the fitness value. That is very good idea. Uh, if you are working with the decision tree, then formation of the decision, decision tree would depend heavily on the feature selection, right? Yes, P1 and P2 initially are selected randomly with random features. Right, but later on in the next generation, the two fit parents would combine to give us a new pair of office springs. So when we say distance between red and blue, is it between red cluster and blue cluster? Cluster? Yes, it is. It is between those two. See, normally in some classifiers like support vector machine, uh, we have you know lines touching the last uh, red point and the line touching the last uh, blue point towards uh, each other would be taken as the two different uh, you know limit and whatever is the distance between them can be optimized it is not point to point point to point but the the you know last point in each cluster okay yeah Fine. So, fitness function could have been distance between red and blue clusters. Fitness function could have been entropy and gain, or you could have even decided upon some kind of computation like angle between the two clusters. If the 
if there was some application requiring this or you could have gone for taking the accuracy as a measurement so yes distance can be calculated using euclidean distance this is one most uh, preferred metric for calculation of the distance otherwise you could go for variety of other kind of uh, distance metrics like manhattan distance or uh, tile distance there are so many others so in mathematics you will find many distance calculation methods but for us we would always want the euclidean distance yes any more doubts here so have you understood the formation of the or formulation of the problem as bit string and its worth as the fitness value then progress towards obtaining certain strings which are more fit okay is it fine so now we move ahead and show you the genetic algorithm of face images let us say if the arrangement is like this c1 c2 c3 c4 etc are the locations and if we linearize this uh, square piece of an image then what do we get we get 23 29 10 2 5 30 12 etc as the pixel values okay so what we have in the figure e is one bit string of size 16 generated randomly so we generated random randomly this chromosome 11001101010011101 what do you understand out of this that means pixel 23 29 5 30 12 these are the ones which are selected in the overall recognition process then you have 52 then 2 15 11 and 13 so wherever you have one in figure you correspondingly select the number in figure d that is how you are making it possible for some value to get included or excluded in the feature uh, vector then we created a random random uh, you know Uh, strip of zeros and ones this gives us a newer uh, you know selection inclusion or exclusion of the features how good the string f would be and how good the string e would be would depend on the on the purpose that we want to solve on something what we want to optimize if i'm optimizing let us say it's um, a noise removal then we will have to see how good these features are in noise removal if i am using this for recognition of the face then we will have to see how good we are able to recognize this face uh, and then we get this uh, yeah how do we get f f is also created randomly so you start a fresh after creating e randomly then again it is like you know throwing a dice and the dice has uh, uh, some 16 values instead of just 6 you have a die which is uh, 16 values and what you get by randomly you know throwing the dice you get uh, uh, 2 so you select the second bit you get next time a 5 so you are selecting the fifth bit it is just pure random and because we do the random number generation using computers so we actually rely on the random number generator algorithm it is a predefined functionality available in most languages so instead of throwing the dice yeah yeah so we have not yet done the crossover we have just created the two bit strings now this time you can see that sorry so this time you have seen that we are able to select using e we are able to select 23 29 okay and using e we are able to select 5 30 12 14 15 16 17 18 19 20 21 22 23 24 25 26 27 28 29 
Okay, and 13. This is something which we are using, which we are selecting using E. This may have its own fitness value. Let me say that the very first string E, or I, may, I will call it PE, PE, because it is represented in E figure, right? PE is this string. And if I have to find out its worth, I will calculate its uh, fitness function. So what will be the fitness function? Fitness value. How will you generate the fitness value of a, a beta string? Suppose I am saying that this is the recognition accuracy. So using these features, if I do the recognition or classification process, let me say that I get something like 84% correct recognition using PE and then there is another another chromosome which I am taking as 1, right? So 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, which is represented in figure F. So what is happening now is that you are actually selecting only 29 here and then you are selecting 2, 5, 30, 12, and then um, 25, 52, and then you are selecting uh, 2 and 15. That's it. So the one which I have drawn through blue, the one which I have underlined through blue, are those are the features which are selected using bit string F. So if I say that. Uh, my classifier gave me the fitness value or the accuracy basically. This is accuracy I'm taking. Accuracy of P of F, I mean the selection of the features using F is let us say, um, uh, you know, 76%. So which is more fit a bit of string? You will say that it is PE. That means the one which is represented in figure E. Okay. So are you able to uh, associate the bit string with its fitness value or not? Yes, E is more fit because I'm having its fitness value as 84%. How we calculate it will again depend on which classifier you're using. Okay. So according to this, Fictitious data, we have PE being more stronger. Now, if we want to do the crossover, right? How will we do this crossover? Yes, so it is 84 just taken fictitiously, but you will get this value by way of classification using the correspondingly selected features, okay? So what is fitness value here? I am taking fitness value as a measure of accuracy. So one thing is that you always have to define how you will calculate the fitness. As a designer of the solution, you have to define how you would calculate the fitness. Like in the previous example, we had decided that we would go for the discriminating power of the features. Now we may say that accuracy of recognition is my uh, characteristic to use for fitness calculation. So how we would have gone for this 84%, right? We may have selected the features corresponding to E. That is something which I have marked here using the red line, red thick line, which has given me these features selected. The first feature, second feature, fifth feature, sixth, seventh, ninth, 11th, 12th, and 13th, and then the, uh, you know, the last one, the 16th. Okay, so that you have to find out which one is what. But the one which I have mentioned according to the um, bit string of E. What is happening now is that each sample in the training data, you are able to map into that much dimensional space. What is the dimension of the space now we have with E? How many ones are there in E? 
10. So there are 10 ones in the chromosome which is represented in figure E. 10 features. So that means out of 16 features of this image portion, we are going to select only those 10 features. And then using those 10 features, if we go for classification, we will get 84% validation samples classified accurately. So accuracy would be something like this, true positive plus true negative divided by all these, all the, the number, total number of uh, samples, okay? So is this part clear how 84% accuracy is arrived? It is not we who, has, who have calculated it you just now. I'm taking it uh, as a fictitious value where this value is representing the accuracy of the classifier using the features represented in E. Okay. So, Naveen, is this okay? Right? Fine. So, then features are represented by inclusion or exclusion and then actual features are selected from all samples all training samples then according to the selected features are subjected for classified training. Classified training refers to finding the boundary, decision boundary and then there is a validation data set. Suppose the size of the validation data set is 50 samples of which let us say you get something like 37, uh, 37 no, uh, somewhere around. 42, 42 samples out of 50. If you are getting that much correctly classified using PE, you say that my accuracy is 84%. Or if you had, you know, some 100 training, 100 validation samples, then 84 got uh, appropriately, correctly classified from where uh, you are getting this accuracy. It is the classifier accuracy using the features which we have in our of uh, this chromosome E. Okay, you can relate the classification and feature selection and genetic algorithm. Okay, so similarly you have uh, this, uh, uh, you know, representation in F and suppose you get the feature uh, fitness value of P of F as 76, then we would say that the chromosome E is stronger than F. So uh, we should, uh, you know, Naveen, we, instead of saying accuracy is equal to fitness, we should say that fitness is equal to accuracy. Here, like earlier example, we took fitness as discriminating power. Now we are taking fitness as accuracy. Is it fine? We are using accuracy as a measure of fitness. Not, we are not saying that fitness is a measure of accuracy. So we have to just rephrase it to understand the worth of this measurement in moving towards a, you know, fitter chromosome. Now, how do we move to the fitter chromosome out of these? So I'm removing this animation and now we will talk about the fitness of the next generation of offsprings. Suppose we just take that we just had, you know, these two parents and we decided to do the crossover at this point, right? So this is the point, I am drawing it by blue color. If I'm taking a crossover point as, you know, something like um, 10 points, then um, that same point I should take for the next parent. So when I have to do the crossover, I will pick up the first left of the of the chromosome E and pick up the right second of the second chromosome, okay? And uh, then I will also, be, so this will form one of a spring. One of a spring will be formed by first half of the first and second half of the second. And then the 
the second offspring will be second child will be made out of the first half of the or first part of the second string and the second part of the first string is this part clear so now you will have another two uh another two chromosomes are these two chromosomes same or different from the previous one will they be different so pe was something which we discussed pf was something which we discussed now we are creating two more offsprings they will have all together a different structure right so then using that structure we have some features included and some features excluded so you can understand that earlier also with pe we were working with you know f1 f2 f5 6 7 9 right or uh, 12 13 14 and 16 these many features earlier we were working with this by new offsprings what is happening is that because the first first half is included of the first string second half of this actually refers to this feature and this features features right so what is different now with the new offspring new offspring will not have 14th and 16th feature right so if a new pe is generated then that will have only first second fifth sixth seventh ninth and uh 12 13 these many features they it will not have now the 14th and the 16th feature that means it will have its own performance it will actually map the training samples in the uh, appropriately dimensioned space and there would be some classification accuracy so let us say the first offspring is o1 okay sorry so let us say first offspring is o1 and the second offspring is o2 and uh, based on our understanding of the crossover point we should get the fitness value fitness value of o1 as something maybe it is maybe it is let us say something like uh, just a minute maybe this uh, fitness value of o1 let us say is something like 80% but uh, fitness value of o2 okay suppose i write fitness value of o2 is equal to um uh, 91% let us say we do not know we get it and we normally get it over the generations if the crossover point is carefully selected it may so happen that we are simply doing a half hazard search right so that is where these uh, parameters of the algorithm how many crossovers where should we cross over how many bits to be mutated what should be pm what should be pc etc very important so let us say the two of the springs give us the fitness values as 80 and 91 so definitely we are if you take the average accuracy of the two of springs as compared to their parents average accuracies uh, can you recall what we had earlier for pe and p1 a uh, pe and pf uh, it was 84 and 76 right so 84 plus 76 and uh, now you have 91 plus 80 right so you can find out whether we are still in the improving mode of course genetic algorithms converge very slowly so this change may not be that visible right in the initial iterations it may not be a very very visible change even if you take the average you get something as uh, 80 for the for the first right it is 80 oh, sorry yeah 80% is the average accuracy of the first generation and uh, this will be somewhere around 85 85.5 as the accuracy average accuracy of the second generation second generation has a two offsets 
uh, two offsprings which are created by the previous generation 85.5 so you will see that the uh, in some sense 80 is less than 84 but it doesn't mean that we are not improving definitely the worth the average worth of the um, parents are increasing and it is not that we are going always to select 80 now we have a pool of four different chromosomes with us then what is the pool pool is having p of initial ones pe then we have p of s right i just marked these as pe and pf because they were represented by the figures e and f and also now the new parents added are o1 and o2 and then let us say out of this we just want to select three parents out of four and want to reject one which is lesser than 82 percent or or let us say which is lesser than 79 percent my threshold could be any so if suppose i'm taking a threshold of 78 percent i definitely will throw out the parent pf so pf should be removed now the new pool of the fit parents new pool uh, of the fit parent will now have p of e o of 1 and uh, o of 2 right and then you can again go for uh, you know finding out their overall fitness find out their worth using the you know uh, cumulative frequencies as we did in the roulette wheel and then you know roll the you know roulette wheel to get some random numbers suppose out of 1 2 and 3 randomly i get 2 i select o1 and randomly i get pe i select that i may select the fittest parents not as the ones as 91 and 84 um, i may i may go on selecting uh, something like you know 84 and 80 which may or may not be the fittest right but of course the one which is the fittest has more chance to get included yes so we remove uh, we remove f because it can happen that we might get fitness less than pf in later generations so that doesn't matter once in one generation we have thrown out f we are we will have a choice of whether to include that or whether not to we will have to see the computational cost of including the forgotten or thrown away chromosomes again uh, all these uh, computations are very heavy so uh, either in the next generation we look at only the pool that we have and we throw away everything which is below certain threshold right or else we can bring back f if there are many other parents which are weaker than this right so when to stop calculating fitness function initially we got 84 percent 76 percent okay after crossover we got 91 and 80 so it can still go on so it is a very good question here you have to understand how to converge right so convergence of these algorithms is very important convergence can be either using the total number of epochs or iterations so how many generations you want this to evolve i may say number of generations okay number of generations uh, would be taken as a major criteria for um, convergence maybe i want for 100 generations and i just want these things to evolve or we would always set a criteria that I want to be closer to 100% accuracy. So, in 100 generations, also we may not achieve 100% accuracy. We may be only reaching from 76 to, let us say, 93%. So, we have to keep on doing this. Yeah. So, uh, will the crossover point across generation should remain same or can be different? 
Yeah, this is also a research question whether you want to change, but I would suggest that we remain same so that we do not go and repeat the same positions many times by simply, you know, uh, doing the crossover haphazardly. If it is more systematic and guided, I think we will not be reaching the same portion and exploring it again and again. That will be a kind of deadlock situation, okay? So mutation is 0 to 1, yeah, it can also be 1 to 0. Suppose I want to decide upon, so I'm clearing this number, okay? So suppose I want to mutate this bit and randomly I had got this number as 8. Out of 16, I generated a random number as 8. So I will mutate this bit to 1, okay? So yesterday we were taking this example of the room corners. So if as soon as one particular bit gets changed from 0 to 1, we are basically moving from one corner to another, right? Similarly, suppose I generated 14 as a random number. From 1, I would be generating it 0. So from the other corner, you would be coming to another corner. It is the visualization. In the three-dimensional space, you can have that kind of visualization. And because these numbers are in the, you know, 16-dimensional space, uh, you can relate your visualization of three-dimensional space to 16-dimensional space. So it is possible from 0 to 1 and 1 to 0. Okay. So I think we can go for a small break now, and then we will come back to discuss remaining things. Okay. <laughs>